There was a lot of information um, delivered today from up here. And believe it or not, there's more in the, uh, in the book. Um, there's a lot of material, a lot of facts, um, and uh, analysis, and even policy uh, discussion. So invite you to dig in uh, online, take a copy with you on your way out. Um, anyone yeah, listening, watching us online, um, it's all available on the New America website with interactive tables and charts, uh, even. And, uh, yeah, we're going to have a policy discussion uh, here. You know, I, I think one of the reasons why wealth matters, just looking at some of the implications, is that we've had a, a, a shift of responsibility of who's handling the risk in society. And, and increasingly, over the last 20 years, it's been individual families and households that are responsible for managing their own retirement savings, putting their children to, uh, to school, uh, in, you know, investing in education, health care costs. And so that risk shift placed a lot of burden uh, on these households, and if the resources aren't there, uh, as we've seen for this kind of uh, rising cohort, well, the implications are, are, are severe, and it raises a lot of questions about generational fairness and equity and reciprocity, and if the prime generation that's working and raising families feels like they don't have the resources to meet their responsibilities, uh, well, it's going to challenge a lot of assumptions about how the society is all, all put together. So in that sense, we're all in this together, mm -hmm. and it's a collective uh, endeavor. And so that's one of the things I wanted to, to open with for, for, for policy remarks. We're going to hear from Liz Hipple and Ray Bashara with their comments. Uh, in in the, the final chapter of the book does have a kind of a, a list, a menu of ideas about a policy response at scale um, to try to respond. And it's divided up into kind of the categories of what do we do for the current cohort that is realizing these financial pressures um, and very important to deal with the, the, the millennial balance sheet. How do we repair the balance sheet going forward? And I think it makes sense, given the evidence we've, we've seen today and in the book, uh, that a large-scale response is needed. And um, whether it is uh, some loan cancellation uh, or some other kinds of opportunities that are created or changes in tax policy. And then there's another set of ideas that are about what do we do with the next generation coming up? How do we fix the system? How do we create these new pathways to progress so people can, I, can, can move on these, this, this pathway, upward mobility, and don't find themselves in the same kind of uh, situation? So I invite you to look, look at the book. We, you know, there's some ideas about housing. There's some ideas about retirement, security, savings, and also um, uh, pathways forward about maybe some new opportunities to create some leveraging shared ownership among uh, the, the rising generation. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to open with my uh, frame. But Liz, I'd like to hear your uh, remarks. And then we'll hear from Ray. And then we can have a discussion to close out the day. Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Liz Hippel. I'm Senior Policy Advisor at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, where I lead our work on economic mobility. And so my perspective on um, the political and policy salience of the millennial wealth gap is very much influenced by that perspective that it's um, Economic resources don't just matter for today and people's outcomes today. It also has implications for intergenerational outcomes in the future. And I think a lot of the comments today um, that we've already heard in earlier panels really illustrates this point. Um, but I would kind of put um, the policy implications of the millennial wealth gap into a couple of buckets. Um, one is that it means that there's um, less financial resources for investment in tomorrow's generation. So um, it's not just an issue for millennials ourselves um, that we have less wealth than prior generations. It also matters for our kids and their outcomes. We know that um, financial resources, both income and wealth, have um, really important implications for educational attainment, for educational completion, um, and um, in turn in earnings in the future. And so if families today have less money to invest in their um, kids' um, education and skills acquisition, that's going to have implications for their kids' earnings potential in the future. Um, I think this also gets to one of the themes that we've heard today, too, of um, the issue of luck of the draw. We can't build policy on luck of the draw. And um, if um, folks today have, um, you know, 
if you have less income yourself to save out of, whether that's for a down payment for a house or whether that's for your kid's future education, that's gonna mean that uh, the importance of your parents' wealth and whether they're able to kick in anything to help you make those investments for yourself and your kids in the future are gonna take on a larger and more disproportionate impact. And that has real um, equity um, implications, some of which we've already talked about today. That means that um, racial wealth gap is even more exacerbated going forward because we know that black Americans were systematically shut out of the housing market um, in the United States. And so you know, they have less housing wealth themselves to be able to then draw on to help their kids go to college or put a down payment on their own house. Um, and then I think um, the other um, issue when it comes to exacerbating um, existing economic and racial inequalities too, there was an excellent question from the audience earlier about um, the implications of, yes, there are um, uh, there is an aging baby boomer population with, as we saw from Anna's presentation, a tremendous amount of wealth. And um, that wealth being passed along to those lucky millennials who happen to be their kids, again, we get back to this issue of you just have luck of the draw. Um, and I think this uh, is not just like runs counter to basic fairness and equity concerns, I think it also has real political implications. Um, we uh, already, I think, are struggling with the country to kind of understand and find a shared sense of responsibility for one another. And if folks are seeing um, outcomes being um, increasingly dictated by um, who was lucky enough to have a parent who was able to send them to college or help them buy a house, that's going to really further exacerbate that lack of social and political cohesion. Um, and the final policy implication um, that I'll note too is um, this also has implications for our overall economic growth going forward. Um, if folks have um, less money to be able to save and invest in themselves, they have lower potential spending in the future, they have less money to invest in their kids, as I've already mentioned, um, and um, we also are you know, foreclosing the opportunity for example, um, the you know, smart, bright kid who has a really great idea and isn't able to actually get that idea off the ground and launch the next Google because they themselves don't come from a background that gives them the startup capital that they need. And that you know, means that our economy is missing out on a lot of great um, you know, opportunities um, and ideas that could really propel new innovation and dynamic economic growth. Thank you, uh, Reed. Congratulations on the book, and uh, it's great to be sharing a stage with you. After uh, working with you for 14 years, I had the good fortune of hiring Reed right out of the White House, <laughs> one of my first hires, one of the best hires, and it's great to be back. So thank you, and congrats to all the authors as well. Um, Reed did con did invite me to contribute to the policy chapter, and we put our heads and our pens together over the summer. Unfortunately, uh, the, you know, uh, my name didn't end up on the chapter because the Fed has a hard time getting policy recommendations out the door, understandably. Um, that's part of the deal when you work at the Fed. Um, and any of your views expressed today do not reflect the Well, I was going to get to that, position. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah, my views definitely don't necessarily reflect the views of the Fed and are my own views, but I, I am going to highlight uh, Areas where I think there's alignment between what the Fed would recommend based on the research that we've done and what Reed ultimately included in the chapter. Okay, so I have um, kind of two buckets here. What do we do for current millennials and then what do we do for future generations is the way I'm thinking about it. And so I, I would just also point out that at the Fed, Anna and I and our colleagues study racial the racial wealth gap, educational wealth gap, and the millennial wealth gap, I think these recommendations would actually impact all three, not just the millennial wealth gap. So um, you know, these are, these are important regardless of what gap we're, we're trying to take on. So I think for, for current generations, let me just mention five things very briefly. I don't need to cover them since they were covered before. Very much picking up on Genevieve's uh, excellent research at the Bureau and now at Aspen. Um, cash, cash reserves are critical. There's four or five bodies of research suggesting that you know, sufficient cash flow liquidity is critical not only for, for resilience, 
uh, but for upward economic mobility and these cash, cash shortfalls are very real, especially for a generation working in a gig volatile economy uh, with flat wages. So very much endorse efforts to do that. Uh, second is something that picks up from Neil Irwin's, uh, the New York Times columnist, new book called How to Win. And it's really about lifelong learning, but it's about what we should be focused on uh, in lifelong learning, which is this idea of um, sort of adaptability uh, throughout, throughout the life course. The job you need to prepare for is probably one that may not even exist. And that could be changing and could be a constant, I'm sorry, throughout your life. And so team-based work uh, is really important. And so we have to think about preparing ourselves for adaptability more than a, a particular, particular job. And I would just note that in other work, uh, we've looked at this, the, the 529 college savings platform as actually an idea, ideal vehicle for that. It's a tool through which people could make investments in somebody's lifelong learning and skills development. Uh, third, uh, really, I mean, the rising cost of college and reliance on student loans. I don't think I need to say anything more than that other than to highlight research that Anna did showing that student loans do in fact impact wealth premiums going forward, in particular for people of color. So, you know, there are real, there are real consequences to student loans among the many other things that folks talked about. Uh, fourth, um, something that June re uh, mentioned in her presentation, I think we really have to think hard about housing affordability and paths to sustainable homeownership. Uh, this is critical throughout the country. Um, people do want to be homeowners. They can't afford it for, for a whole range of reasons. So it's both affordability for people who aren't, who aren't ready to own homes, but then sustainable homeownership for those who are. Um, and then finally, uh, and this one's a little more out of the box, I guess. I think we have, to, we have to think of new sources of income and wealth and new sources of ownership going forward. I think uh, great work at Aspen, where I'm a fellow, uh, has found that the, the, the historic link between work and wealth has been broken. You can't assume that earned income is sufficient to build enough savings and wealth for resilience and mobility. So what do you do in that world, right? What do you do in that world? I mean, we, we have this idea in the U.S., which is not necessarily true in other countries, that um, you can accumulate enough wealth privately that you can kind of get by without the state necessarily. And so we've created a, you know, we have a country where you, you, you have to have the ability to accumulate quite a bit of private wealth in order to manage your lives and your kids' lives. Well, if that world isn't necessarily true for probably the majority of Americans now, and certainly for millennials, we have to think very creatively about other sources of ownership uh, and income. And so for some people, that might be the basic income uh, work that, that many folks talk about for the work that I'm interested in and doing through Aspen is thinking about what are, what are some other assets that could be monetized, claimed as an asset, monetized, and then used as a source of wealth. So uh, organized a round table for next month, you know, trying to bring, bring together folks around the idea of the data dividend. You know, could you claim your own data as an asset and they, then be paid for it? Uh, Peter Barnes has talked about, you know, the, the, you know, the carbon absorption capacity of the sky. You know, there's a whole range of assets that if we just claim them as public assets could be a source of revenue and actually help with things like climate change, data privacy, data ownership. So um, I'm really, really interested in this, uh, uh, you know, ESOPs are another part of this, shared equity homeownership, which uh, Signa Mary has done some great work on and Caroline. So anyway, the point is we have to get out of this box that earned income is, is simply enough. So let me just close with two very brief thoughts on future generations. Um, I, you know, I think, of course, the work of Chetty is really important, but what the, the big takeaway there is the investments that happen locally really matter a lot. So if you really want to affect the trajectory of a kid's life, make investments in place, um, and uh, more so necessarily than the national investments, although those are really important too. And then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about early education and early assets. Huge fan of baby bonds, child development accounts, put 20 years into that. Reed and I worked on some bills here in Congress back in the day. Uh, they're happening all over the state, and I, I don't think there's a better way to address equity, inclusion, savings, financial inclusion than, than you know, starting each, each kid uh, fresh with, with some savings and assets. So, um, yeah, and let me just close with an observation that Phil Longman made, former colleague. 
he said that um, for many, for you know, for through, mo through most of American history, the gap between uh, the generations was growing and large, uh, large and growing, but for really good reasons. It's because each generation was doing better than the last. Starting in about the 70s, the gap continued to grow between the generations, but for the opposite reason. It's because kids are doing worse, right, uh, than their parents. So um, I, that always struck me as really profound. So I, I think the, the wealth gap is not only a threat to the American dream, um, it, it really is. It's a threat to the social contract, too. And that's my final point, and it's just picking up on something Reed said. The social contract, when it was largely put in place uh, in the New Deal and the, great, and, and the great society, was premised on the idea that we would have rising productivity, broad wealth distribution, and sharing prosperity, uh, so that future generations could, in fact, afford to pay for previous generations' retirement and security. Well, my goodness, if the future generations aren't prosperous anymore, then how does the social contract even work? Right? So I, I really do think this is, a, this is a question of generational equity, fairness, and sustainability, as Liz talked about. So I'm in favor of some kind of a, a, like a generational adjustment in the social contract. And I, I would have to think hard about how that would work. But I think we have to think along those lines. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, some of those ideas are uh, woven into the last policy chapter. And, and that challenge of how do you mm -hmm. uh, readjust the, the generational, the, the deal, and, and what the fairness looks like. With, if there's not going to be kind of growing prosperity, mm -hmm. uh, who's going to handle that, that responsibility? And, and something that we haven't talked about today, but it's in the last chapter, is that you know, the, the essential need of a program like Social Security, which uh, is, is there. Uh, as a backstop at, at the end or for other families uh, experiencing vulnerability uh, throughout the life and, and, and how that's going to need to be not only supported but probably expanded upon. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely interested in, in some um, comments and feedback of, of the room since we, there was a lot of information uh, today. So if there are, are questions or comments, uh, um, we'll, we'll move the mic around. I'll also say that, that, that reinforcing housing as, as this other concept um, that we've talked about today. One of the slides that Jung um, presented that maybe um, you can see better online is to show that when that the importance of home ownership essentially to predicting future uh, wealth outcomes and, and trajectory. And when that even when it doesn't occur, a real divide. But if it occurs later or delayed or with more leverage, uh, the, 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 the impact of undermining uh, wealth long term is very important. So therefore, what are the alternatives? Uh, how, how do we uh, jumpstart mm -hmm. responsible home ownership? What are some of the alternatives to kind of this binary rent to own? Um, and I think that there's some ideas about how to uh, create some other space, shared equity home ownerships, cooperatives. And then as Ray uh, talked about, and there's, there's more in the, in, the, in the paper about these, these, I, these ideas, and I think we want to do some more work on them, is yeah, what are some other alternative things that can be leveraged, other sources of new income, uh, new wealth that we haven't t tapped yet? I mean, Alaska has a, a permanent fund where mm -hmm. they give a dividend to all their uh, citizens based upon the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the mining of their, their resources. So um, that's something I think that we mm -hmm. need to put Great on the model. table as, as big ideas. OK, let's start uh, here. And we only have a few minutes left, but, um, but yeah, let me flag me if you have a, a comment. Here you go. Thank you. Connie Malone, a retired member of the New York State Union of Teachers. In all of this discussion, I have to refer back to Brent Cohen and the extreme veracity, the wonderful way you expressed what was promised your generation and what has not been delivered. The gig economy, even if you have a professional degree, you came out with six-figure loan, and you were OK with that because you expected that you would be able to pay that back. Because after all, if you could get a six figure loan, then you were in a category that would be able to pay that loan back. No, no, it was a big, big lie. And now these kids who are holding back on having kids, and I hate to sound like a cattle breeder, but <laughs> they're the ones who have the best gene pool, OK? And they're the ones not having the kids 
because they can't afford them are in a gig economy. So where do any of you stand? Have you addressed the importance of supporting the rebuilding of unions to support the rebuilding of the United States? Yeah, thank you. That actually isn't in the final chapter. Uh, but I have written about that in other uh, venues, and I think the decline of being able to have kind of collective bargaining um, has been a big driver in growing inequality uh, in, in the country. Um, so it is something. And yeah. I want to give a yeah. shout out. I personally do not um, work on um, unions or um, research into monopsony, but I have a colleague, Kate Bong, at Equitable Growth, who does amazing research on um, both the decline of workers' bargaining power and also, um, more generally, the rise of monopsonistic um, markets where you know, there's only one employer, and so that can have not literally one employer, but limited number of employers, and so that drives down your options as a worker um, and depresses wages. So you should check out Kate's research on this, yeah. And I will say an underbelly of some of this work is also about the pressure it puts on families mm -hmm. and the challenges of having children and the expense of that and how just when families are really feeling the most financial pressures when they, when they have children is also when they're in the kind of prime of their work years and it, it's where we need to think harder about some other ways of supporting them so that it's not a, as, as a big of a sacrifice. And I, I would just add that, that Genevieve pointed out the systemic nature of these inequalities and the institutional nature of it. This is one of the important institutions in stemming that rising inequality. Any final other questions here? Okay, in the back. Hi, uh, Robert Charetta with International Investor. I came in late, so forgive me if you've, if you've covered this. I don't see it, I just picked up the, a copy of the report. There's going to be a vast transfer of wealth, yeah. too, from uh, the older generation yes. to this younger generation. That's, I imagine, is going to exacerbate the, yes. the wealth gap. Uh, you've already discussed this, I guess. Well, it was it was raised. Uh, I, mean, I think that the pr there is a lot of I wealth that's the accumulating. Reserve or anyone has done research on that. Yeah. Can you, can you guide me there? Yeah. I mean, Signa Mary had some some comments about it. I mean, you know, clearly there's wealth uh, accumulating to the the oldest households, and we know you can't mm -hmm. take it with you. So where, what's going to happen? And you know, we think it's going to increase inequality in terms of how it's distributed. It's largely white, well-educated, older households that have the wealth in the first place and the ones that are in a position to transfer the wealth. So it's I think you're right. It's it, likely to exacerbate it, wealth inequality. It, it, very much so. I, I just yeah. got a comment on this because mm -hmm, right. it's not just, it, you already see it in terms of education clearly. You know, the parents who can afford uh, to mm -hmm. step up and help their children uh, makes an immense difference. But when that transfer really takes place in the coming 10, 20 years, you're going to see those who come from well-to-do families sitting in a very nice position, and those who aren't yeah. are going to be worse off than ever before. So okay. I think you're going to see extreme differences here. I mean, it is true, and it is worrisome. But I'd also say that most wealth transfers happen throughout life, not at the end of life. And so we have to be as concerned about those transfers, like paying for a a home or an education, that's actually where most wealth transfers happen, although we should be concerned about those transfers as well. And also, it is certainly a moment for public policy, I mean, to, to, to step in and change how we, we do kind of tax and, uh, and mm -hmm. distribute those resources. So certainly Please. something to... Can I just yeah. add on to Ray's point about um, the um, influence of wealth throughout one's life course. Um, a sociologist at University of Michigan, Fabian Pfeffer, has a really great phrase for this, which is that the end of life transfer is just the cherry on top of a lifetime of um, wealth, uh, both buying a lot of advantage, it buys your school district, it buys your college education, but it also um, subtly influences people's decision-making process throughout their life. There's a big difference between contemplating job X versus job Y. One might be really secure but lower paying. One might offer a lot of great opportunity but be riskier. Depending on what kind of family background you're coming from, you're going to have a very different risk calculation about what life path it makes sense um, to take um, knowing that you have that safety net to fall back on versus you don't. 
Um, and so absolutely agree that when um, end of life transfers happen, that especially given the quantity, um, it will be profound. But I, don't, I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that wealth inequality plays out throughout uh, life. Yeah. But uh, just a final comment on that. We talked to a lot of financial advisors, and I, I'll tell you how extreme their point of view is. They look for the, the last surviving parent of a wealthy ha household to seek out the children who are about to get that wealth. Because during the course of that lifetime, the parents might well be saying, we don't want to spoil our children. We'll give them what's necessary, but we're going to hold back the substantial portion of our wealth. When that second parent dies, it's a big difference suddenly in that mm -hmm. in that life of the uh, of the millennial in this case. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, uh, this was a big topic. There's a lot of information uh, in the report that that we we covered. Um, and uh, yeah, please um, dig in. Um, tell your friends. Certainly interested in any feedback along the way. And thanks for your time and engagement today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.